The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools and appliances just to find out what's inside. In this video, we're going back to the 1990s to follow up on the Apple Newton. Um, I don't feel too ashamed to say I didn't know too much about the Apple Newton. Um, the only thing I really knew about it was this episode from The Simpsons. Hey Dolph, take a memo on your Newton. Beat up Martin. Bah! And I feel like that little outtake probably tells you everything you need to know about the Newton in terms of how it was perceived in public and when it was released. It was a PDA-esque device although I think it probably predated the term PDA. It was focused a lot around the handwriting and the natural input. And I think it wasn't necessarily a world-changing product. Not surprisingly, the battery up battery doesn't work. So very basic in functionality. It's a personal data assistant. You've got a contacts list. A calendar. <laughs> Extras, which just kind of are the tools, I would say, rather than extras, but maybe that's just me. What we will do, turn that volume up so you can get a nice big ear full of all these wonderful sounds. Lovely. Now, let's try. The one I got is working, but it is missing its stylus. I, I know, who loses a stylus out of a 23-year-old device? We're in the calendar. Let's add to the to-do list. Let's say, meet Clem. I've got got can. Sorry, Clem, looks like we're not gonna make that date. Newton as a platform was released in 1993, and I think it really reflects the kind of style of things from 1993. I mean, the layout of the software is just, just compared to our multitasking, window switching, app based life that we live these days, this is clunky and really hard to use. And when you consider that most of this is really quite encased in a single device, uh, I, I, I really, I can see why PDAs were utterly destroyed by mobile phones as soon as they sort of standardised in about 2006 and seven. Anyway, we're not here to talk about the software too much, so let's turn it off and open it up. So in terms of parts and ports, I mean, it's, it's big. I mean, if you compare this to my Sony smartphone, this is a Xperia Z5 Mini, in case anybody wants to compare. I mean, it, it's, it's a lump. I mean, look at the size of that. It's not exactly pocket. Um, and you've got to bear in mind that this was competing contemporarily with things like the Scion 3 series, which had come out a couple of years beforehand in 1991. Um, and even compared to that, it, it's big. And I'm not sure the handwriting recognition was good enough to actually qualify it as a big success or really worthwhile. Don't know, we'll see. So anyway, just to cover it, we've got power, a contrast wheel, which of course you get on old school reflective LCDs, very important. Release button to make sure the flap can open. Uh, you've got ports down here. This is a transfer port, which I've got a couple of accessories for. Power, you could plug in a DC barrel jack. Um, you've got a lock and a release for a PCMCIA expansion card. I believe these had additional external memory, along with other accessories you could get for it. There is an infrared port on the top edge, and that's pretty much all you get. I understand that there was a dock you could sort of stand this up in and it would charge on there. Yeah, that's that's all you get for your money. So this of course has four AA batteries, which I don't think lasted all that long. There were rechargeable options and had a built-in system battery, which was always a nice touch. So it didn't lose the battery. No, it didn't lose the time and date every time you uh, wanted to change the batteries or it ran out of main battery. And for me, it's kind of weird that it came with more documentation 
more paperwork, more pamphlets, more warranty information, more user manuals than the device itself. It's, yeah. I feel like there's a, a history lesson in here. If your handbook for how to use your device is almost as big as the device, that probably means it's not simple enough. Now, that's not a criticism of Apple, that's just a contemporary observation of products from the 1990s, computing especially. This is, of course, back in the day before people started gluing stuff shut. So, we're gonna have a nice easy time getting this open. Do not remove this battery unless the main batteries are fully charged and installed. <laughs> oh well, too late. It can't be that serious a warning, can it? They can't have actually put the operating system on volatile memory, can they? Can they? No, well, I guess we'll see. No, brittle plastics all the way. Well, there's a lesson to you. If you want a device that's gonna last more than 26 years, be careful of the plastics. I mean, obviously don't know the condition of where or how this was stored. It's entirely possible that this has been stored in someone's loft and has gone through a lot of very harsh heat cycles. So you can't guarantee it was the material and not the storage method, but it is not survived well, more than cosmetically anyway. Oh my goodness me. So other than destroying part of that already. So even some of these screws where they've gone through the plastic and they put it under compression as the screws have threaded in have just destroyed themselves. And it looks like the battery bay is trying to come with it, which is fine, I guess. It makes kind of sense that if you've got the barrel jack here, it looks like regulators for the power over here, as well as these two pads, which contacted the case for that dock charging position, that there's gonna be power connectors that connector looks like it runs straight over here. So it makes sense that that's got to come out with it. A little bit taken aback because the battery case actually belongs to this piece of plastic up here, which runs all the way down the back, covering the touchscreen. And I can see down in this gap, a big crystal. There are still cables which run underneath that, which I can't move until that's out and it's screwed in so there's little expectation that I would realistically be able to get in there and I might be able to but that's that's not a decent sequence for assembly so are they really suggesting that during assembly they had to solder these ribbons as a manual process after the first bit of plastic gone on surely not all right well there's that ribbon that ran underneath still this four pin connector running across here which darts underneath there to another board, but at least I've got half a chance of getting to the screws along this side now. That That's a crazy order of assembly, that can't be right. The fact that I can't separate these two boards and they're screwed down in the corner and on the top, that's just, that has to be soldered in, manu in sequence of assembly. But that's really, we'll call it undesirable. Okay, there is the display and touchscreen module, digitizer module, whatever you would like to choose to call it. Yay, there we go. That's most of the components of an Apple Newton. So anyway, I was a little bit surprised to find that Apple Newton is not the name of the product. Newton is the name of the operating system, which is actually licensed to be manufactured by other people too. So it wasn't just Apple products that had the Newton software and the handwriting recognition, there were others as well. Now, Apple aficionados can correct me, but as far as I'm aware, this is the last time Apple manufactured or allowed other manufacturers into their ecosystem for hardware. There is a significance to that because this device was designed starting in 1988 and released the original one, which was the original message pad as it became known, in 1993. Now this message pad 110 was the third, there was a message pad 100 in between, and there were a couple of other iterations, but they were all stopped in 1998, which anybody that knows their Apple history will know that's when Steve Jobs returned. Steve Jobs was away from Apple from 1980 
1995 to 1998. And when he returned, this project, this product, this operating system line unceremoniously stopped. Now, I feel like this is a product which I'm, I'm not a big subscriber to Steve Jobs being the, the one person with the driving vision behind Apple's success or anything. However, from what little I know of him and however questionably accurate the biopics of, of Steve Jobs have been, I do feel like this is a product and a product range which he wouldn't have let happen. You know, this is me speculating. I, I've no basis for really knowing the answers to any of this and there are plenty of people which know more about the subject matter than me. I'm happy to be corrected. I'm happy to talk about it. Let me know. Uh, one thing I will say that's quite interesting is that the last few fasteners I've taken apart are actually nut and bolt combinations going down to what looked like a, an M1.5 screw or less or whatever the Imperial equivalent is. It's quite unusual to see that. I mean, in any product from any manufacturer, you don't normally see that. That, I'm afraid to say, is the sum contents of everything you get. What is interesting though, is what this is quite clearly the great great grandfather of. So if we look quite closely here, the first thing that you're likely to notice is that this has an ARM 6 series chip on it. At this point, it wasn't a system on a chip. It was just an ARM processor. So that's a re risk processor reduced instruction set computing, which is what every smartphone bar a couple of weird ones from a few years back. I think there was a, an Intel handset which came and went without much fanfare. So this actually has a huge amount in common with modern smartphones. And it's interesting that, uh, and I realized that it's Wikipedia is questionable the quality of the content on there, but it's interesting that whoever wrote it, whether they knew any detail of the product or not, said the, the direct super product that superseded this was the iPad. Let that sink in for a moment. We went from these in 1998, something like a 13 year gap. I think it was 2011 the first iPad came out. But actually, there's a lot in common here. All right, the battery management is changed from internal to external, but still ARM processor, coupled memory. And Apple have actually used this LSI chip as an integrator. There are a lot of discrete components that are built into this single chip. Now, actually, if they built the ARM processor design and into this integrator, you would have a basic system on a chip. So it's kind of interesting that this is, this is a direct grandparent of modern phones. However much as a product, it may have been not the best. It, it definitely is in there with the lineage of other hardware. So down here, we've got some Sony chip ICs, which I'm gonna go on a limb and say are probably memory. We've got the same on the other side. Um, I will have to look up whether they are uh, ROM or RAM, or probably RAM. This connector's got Foxconn on it. I remember when I was tearing down the iMac G4, being surprised that the IDE ribbon was a Foxconn part. But over here, this multi-pin connector for the serial out is also a Foxconn part. And Apple and Foxconn have been friends forever. And again, this, this weird ribbon to avoid the power running around on the PCB, it's a bit weird. And I've got to say, actually, this little uh, daughter board here, which was sold in, which was causing me a lot of the trouble, actually quite a nice little touch. It delivered power to the back of the LCD over here somewhere, but also has this lump on it. Now that sat between the two batteries. Now I'm pretty sure, so it actually sat in this little ridge between two batteries. Now you could get this with a rechargeable pack and I'm pretty sure you'll find out that's a temperature sensor protected from overheating during charging and discharge. That's a nice touch. Okay, so each one of these little uh, integrated circuits are CMOS RAM, 131,000 words. So at eight bits a word, that's 2.5 meg-ish. Although the fact there's CMOS uh, doesn't bode well for the fact we took the battery out. I say took the battery out, battery fell out. Main ARM processor, integrator, Apple integrators. And up the top, I should have said this, this massive, and I, I can only assume it's RF shielded 
because it runs at a high speed. This is actually the infrared port. That enabled you to communicate with other devices, other compatible devices, using infrared. This, this I see over on the back is actually a Zilog, although I don't recognise that logo. It looks like something else. It looks like W-A-L-S. But that part number, when you look it up, is a Zilog chip, and that's actually dated copyright in 1981. So, you know, that serial controller is an old board by the time it's being used in something in 1994. Just for anyone that doesn't know, or hasn't already realised, this display board is a reflective LCD display. And if you look really carefully, you can see on the front edge, there's like this completely discrete glass panel. Now that, just like a modern smartphone, is a split between the screen and the display, the thing that actually generates the image, and what now is called the digitizer. So that's actually what senses the touches. Now this is a resistive one. So this actually needs force on a point to measure resistance. And you see here it's got a, a little four pin connector. Now that has basically X, Y coordinates and where you press gives an impedance across X and Y. So it will know that on one point at a time, it's only single point touch, where over that entire screen is being touched. Now you'll notice that the screen is actually only from here upwards. These items down here are just static images behind the uh, digitizer. And as you touch those, it incorporates that into its field of sensing, I guess we'll call it. What that is essentially all the Apple Newton came down to. Some reasonably simple electronics, a low resolution black and white display, resistive touch sensor. That today would be very easy to assemble and very cheap to assemble using some discrete parts. You could build one of these using an Arduino with similar kind of levels of power without much trouble. It's interesting to see that back as recently as 1993, this was like a flagship device. But it does tell us something that touchscreen didn't lend itself particularly well to the interfaces of the day. It took a change in culture of the physical input before mass adoption of touchscreens. And I, I, I feel comfortable saying that having owned a smartphone with a touchscreen in 2004, Motorola 1000. It worked, but actually the touchscreen was such a novelty, it didn't really lend much to the, the usefulness of the device. Fast forward a very few years to 2007 and the first iPhone, and then very shortly afterwards the first Android phones. Sorry about the previous contentious to anyone. But that resistive technology uh, change into capacitive, the whole use of your finger with a light touch versus using a stylus that you have to be very finite with, all of a sudden, the game changes. And with the user interface behind it, welcome to the world we're in now. Look, I hope you find that interesting. It's a very simple teardown from my point of view today, but I hope you found it interesting all the same, looking at the great-great-grandfather of the iPad. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.